Thanks for having me, everyone. Happy to be here. Happy to help uh, share what I've learned in the last couple months, which has been quite the process of adapting to virtual field days. And we are well on our way. Field day season is in full swing. I think we've probably hosted 10-ish now, and we have a lineup of 60. So I, and I felt comfortable sharing now because I have facilitated two field days um, on Zoom, and then they're shown live on Facebook. So that's what, I'll share my experience with you today, and I have a bunch of resources to share uh, for additional information. So <clears throat> firstly, we still opted to create our um, printed field day guide. It's all, there's also a digital copy available. It's on our website. Members received the field day guide booklet in their mailboxes earlier this week. Um, and also in addition to that, for about three, two to three weeks now, we have had our field day events page filled out on our website. So every individual field day has a landing page. And so we organize it by month. You can click on the month and then it pulls up everything, every event in that month. Um, I also just wanted to draw your attention to the, that upper right-hand corner read about how to attend virtual field days. So both in the print booklet and on the website, there is kind of a short tutorial for farmers who you know, we walk them through how you download the Zoom app. If you don't have Facebook, you can still tune in, but you can't comment, et cetera. Those types of like, you know, housekeeping on how to even attend a virtual event. So that could be helpful if you're, you know, please take from that language if need be. So um, we, mo the majority of our field days are, are shown live on Facebook through Zoom on the back end. But we do have three different platforms. So um, in addition to Facebook Live, we have just straight Zoom that we're treating as a, as a webinar. Um, and then we also have shared learning calls. We might have one to two planned and it was really for um, farmers. For example, I, Jamie Hostetler, he's a grass finisher, um, beef farmer in Eastern Iowa. He's Mennonite. He doesn't, he wouldn't be able to use Facebook or Zoom. And so we set up a shared learning call, which I think it's okay to just, um, you know, switch things up and give people a different outlet and a phone call is really easy. So just to go through a few of like the pros and cons of these platforms, um, we love that Facebook reaches a really large audience, especially if we wanted to boost posts um, and put some money towards advertising in that way. Um, we've noticed that we've had a caller from Quebec, a caller from Ukraine, and someone from Brazil. And I don't know exactly, I, they're finding it through Facebook. So that's, we. I guess we're, as bummed as we are that we can't host in-person events, we think it's pretty amazing to be able to get a national or global audience. Um, and that also, the side benefit of that could be the opening up of more sponsor possibilities. Maybe other sponsors that are outside of our current network would be willing to sponsor something um, or sponsor our our field days or maybe our conference, which we're thinking we're also going virtual with. So um, Facebook Live works super well from the standpoint of viewing it. The only issue is that you can only comment in the, in the text box. So it's just like a chat function essentially. Um, whereas if we were to use Zoom, without Facebook, attendees can, we could unmute them, we can ask them to speak and ask their questions. Um, it's more interactive in that way. But the con with Zoom is there's less exposure to in, out, attendees outside of our networks, whereas Facebook, you're reaching so many networks that, that we don't even know, how, you know, depending on how much it's shared and liked. 
Um, and then of course the shared learning car call, you don't need internet for it. It's low tech, it's easy, but then again, it's just a phone call. So there's no visual aids. I will say that, so we're hosting, so Jamie Hostetler's field day is titled the art of grass finishing. And this will be a very good practice in him, in, for him in articulating around like what a cow looks like when it's finished. So he's looking forward to that, um, although he would love to host in person. And we probably will do an in-person field day with him next summer if, if we can still host in-person events. But um, we are, will use this phone call as a kind of a teaser to that um, and talk about what Jamie, what, how he will host in the future and how he wishes to host. So anyway, obviously with, with um, Facebook Live and Zoom, you're going to need good internet. We realized that, I'll get to some of this later when we talk about like primary staff and tech staff, but I realized from my house and a few other staffers, we didn't have strong enough internet to play um, pre-recorded videos. And so now we've delegated certain staffers who have stronger internet as tech staff because their video won't come through choppy. So it's just small things like that that we've learned through practicing and testing. Um, and I, I alluded to this, but when we're using Zoom, we're always using the webinar format. We haven't been using the meeting format because there's two different types of, of Zoom. Um, feel free to chime in with any questions as I go here. So like I had said, so we have lead staff and tech staff. Um, and then we have either one farmer host or multiple farmer hosts. And the um, last field day I did had um, a primary host, but he, it was all about how he integrates his neighbor's cattle to improve his soil health. And we had the neighbor farmers there. So I treated them all as hosts and I'll show you how I did that. Um, so they could all be able to tune in to hear what was going, but we could mute them and also not share their video so they weren't seen. So obviously with any event, with any field day, it's important to build an agenda, but we've noticed that it's even more important to have a very tight agenda, like down to the minute for these virtual field days because we're not in the field. We can't just really go with the flow. Um, and so this is where having a tech, at least one tech test before the actual event is really important. And ideally you'd have an agenda fleshed out before that tech test so you can really walk through things. Um, and I've been sharing the agenda with the farmer hosts well in advance. They're making edits, we're timing things out, all of that. Um, I have noticed that when the actual live event is taking place, it's going faster than I accounted for in my agenda. Um, but that's where I make up with it, make up that time by seeding questions I already had in my back pocket or soliciting questions from the, the viewers. Um, the other thing that is really helpful for the farmer is if they, he or she can have someone else there filming them. Um, in one case, um, we had a farmer's granddaughter there who was on tech um, and filming him the whole time. So he didn't have to finagle with a tripod and trying to film himself. Um, that helped a ton. So I have a few more points coming up on that. But if you are to host a field day with more than one farmer, um, that you, you will treat them in Zoom as panelists and you will, you know, treat them as speaker one, speaker two, speaker three, speaker four, et cetera. And then once you enter their name and email, you are then able to, 
you press on copy and you're able to generate a unique URL for each of them to log in, to log into Zoom. So they don't have to do anything for, through Facebook. They are connected via Zoom, but the unique URL function is really important. Um, this allows them to hear what's going on, to see what's going on, um, but we have the control to keep them muted and to keep them unseen or, or to show their video if we'd like to. Um, so that's just a function that we learned about that has been really helpful. Uh, originally, um, for the one example where I had the farmer who works with his neighbors, we were just treating him as a panelist and the neighbors were just kind of on the side and the host was listening to us through his earphones and relaying the messages to them in the field. And then we realized that everybody just needed to be connected to hear what was going on. And that worked a ton better. Um, so obviously practice is what is needed. So we've realized that we originally started just scheduling one tech test, but we've, we've been doing two tech tests with hosts. Um, I think that will lessen as we all get more comfortable with this. Um, we're as staff and without the farmer host, we're also doing tech tests together to troubleshoot whatever it might be. Um, so you, you're welcome to read through the screen. I'll be sharing this with you as well so you can revisit it. Um, but tech tests are just extremely important you're going to want the farmers to be standing in the, in the area of the field where they're actually be broadcasting from. Um, and obviously, uh, farmers are going to need to have their Zoom app down downloaded on their phone. Um, and then I'll get to this, but we sent them equipment to use, which isn't totally mandatory, but I will say that the speakers that we sent them work a lot better than the typical earbuds for mostly to prevent wind interference. Another really important um, piece of information that we figured out is that when we go to share our screen, so either the, usually this is pertains to the person on tech, the tech staff is who is playing any pre recorded videos. So I should back up. Some of our field days are 100% live from the field and there's no pre recorded videos um, mixed in. Um, the two field days that I've done, we have had pre recorded videos. So it's a hybrid of toggling between that video and then going live to the field. If you do show pre recorded videos, when you go to share your screen to share that video, it's really important to click both of these things at the bottom left hand, share computer sign and optimize screen share for video clip. If you don't do that, they, you may not, the, the sound may not come through. It will on your end, so you won't, it will on the tech end, so that person wouldn't know, but it won't on Facebook. Um, and then optimize for video clip, which just helps with, the pixelation and clarity of the, of the video. So just remember to click those two things. The other thing is we originally were embedding videos into PowerPoint, but realizing that was degrading the quality. So the rawest, the rawest form of your media clip is the best, whether that's windows media player or whatever media player you want to use. Um, We've been having farmers send us large videos through Dropbox, and then we, we, the tech staff downloads that video onto their computer prior to the field day. So we're playing from that downloaded copy, not playing from Dropbox. Um, and so here's the equipment that we sent. So there's a, um, a, a mic, um, there is, there are two different tripods and then there's this, this Bluetooth earpiece. Um, some of the farmers who are doing the pre-recorded video, it is great if they can have a mic, essentially, it's kind of like a lapel mic, it, it clips on to their shirt. And then 
um, it's important that they have a tripod, especially if they're the only ones in the field and they have to set that up and film themselves. The headpiece here, I think is probably the most important thing. It, um, you do want to work with your host to get them to sync that to their phone prior to the tech test or even at the beginning of the tech test, but it's great if you can have them do that prior to. Um, and that headset has been pretty instrumental in cutting down on wind noise um, and it's coming through really clearly. So we're very happy with that. The only change that I would make is when we know that we have a field day where there's going to be more than one farmer presenting, I would send them three as many headsets as there are people presenting, which is what we didn't do. And we ran into issues with the earbuds. So just best practices for field days. Obviously you want to build your agenda. You're going to go through that agenda with your tech test and you're going to practice your heart out. Um, and the guidance that we provide for our speakers is to always hold the phone horizontally so they fill the screen or else on Facebook, it, it's not filling the screen. Um, have them wipe down their phone lens ahead of time. Um, you know, keep your back at the wind if you can. And we've, no, we've, we've, we've worked during a tech test, we were able to like help a farmer figure that out and it helped a ton. And then obviously don't um, shoot towards the sun. Um, and those are all general standard things that we troubleshoot during the tech test. And if we have to during the field day, if there's um, when, if the sun's glaring or if the wind is really loud, it's okay to just stop and say, Tom, you know, could you please position yourself differently? We're getting a lot of wind noise. So we've just had to do that. And I think it's kind of a pretty natural, a natural thing while we're live. And then just a few bits about actually going live on Facebook. Um, our tech staff is who um, there's a button to press to go live. And essentially what Facebook does is it gives you a two minute countdown. And so at one minute is when I, I, you know, we log in with our farmer hosts 15 minutes early. And so we've been talking, we've been troubleshooting and I ask everyone to go quiet at one minute. And then I'll start a countdown, you know, I'll say one minute, 30 seconds, 10, nine, eight. And so um, the, the other thing, and so from my screen, so how I set this up on my computer, I have dual monitors and one is my um, Zoom with the screen that I'm sharing, which is my intro slides. And the second screen is Facebook Live. So I can see exactly what it looks like on Facebook. Um, as a viewer, um, so I can also watch that countdown. The other thing to keep in mind is that there is five to 10 second lag, depends on internet connection between the Zoom and between Facebook Live. So it, you know, it kind of is hard to navigate at times, but you just kind of have to, you know, you have to keep Facebook Live silent in the background and just be aware that there, there is a lag. Um, the other th good thing to remember is when you do go live, wait, pause for about three to five seconds before you start your introduction. So then just a little bit more about what we're doing on the back end. So as lead staff, which is what I have been for the two field days so far, it's you know, I'm doing the introductions. I introduce our partners or our sponsors and I talk about housekeeping, about using the chat box, when the field day will end, and that we'd like them to fill out an evaluation form at the end by clicking a link that we'll put in the chat box. I moderate the Q&A that's coming in. So that's why I have, another reason why I have Facebook up on my second screen is to moderate those questions. Um, I have to guide or prompt that speaker. If there's too much wind, ask them to move. If I can't hear them, ask them to unmute themselves, things like that. Something I've noticed is that if I want to mute or unmute a speaker, I can do that, but I think something pops up on their screen that says you are being asked to be unmuted, except, and they're not paying attention to that. 
um, when they're trying to run a field day and talking to the camera, they're not looking at that. So I've just had to verbally say while we're live, John, can you unmute yourself? And then they'll do it. And that's okay. That's kind of the way it is. Um, and then of course, like I said, I ask attendees to fill out the evaluation um, about two minutes before the end of the event and then share a final thank you slide. Um, what the tech staff is doing is they're responsible for going live and for ending the event. Um, they're watching both Facebook and Zoom. I'm, you know, as lead staff, I was also doing that. The other important thing is they're switching between the video feeds. So when I'm doing an introduction or the lead staff at PFI is doing the introduction, the spotlight is on us. There's a spotlight function in Zoom, which, uh, how do you get there? It might be with the three dots at the top um, in the blue box. So there's a, so I'm spotlighted when I'm doing the intro and then we turn that spotlight right over to the farmer host and they're spotlighted. And what that means is that when there's not a screen share happening or a video share happening, they fill the screen. Um, so we toggle between spotlights and that is already um, laid out and planned out in our agenda. And, you know, we usually have like an, a separate chat between lead staff and tech staff up so we can know if there's any sort of technical issues. Um, and tech staff can step in and help with question moderation if needed, if the chat box is being bombarded with questions. And then we let farmers just do their thing and guide them along. So a few more best practices. Obviously, we want it to feel natural. Um, we, you know, just remember to relax, take some deep breaths beforehand. We have started to ask attendees to submit their name and location in the chat box just to make it have a, you know, a friendlier feel. Um, I always have a set of prepared questions to fill space or let's say um, the farmer would have technical issues in the field and be disconnected. Then that's a time where we could pose some questions and get a discussion going. Um, <clears throat> And then, of course, we want to be there to support that farmer, um, keep the dialogue going, provide feedback, uh, and prompt them to get back on track. Another reason why agenda is very important. Um, and then um, when we're sharing our thank yous, the tech staff will end the event and it will show on Facebook that the live video has been interrupted. So um, they've pressed a button that says stop live stream, stream rather than end the whole meeting. So now it's not, it's not live on Facebook any longer, but text PFI staff and farmers are still connected and can debrief and talk and whatever, whatever, say our thank yous again to them. And that's been pretty helpful because a lot of times farmers are thinking like, oh, that did not go as well as I wanted it to, that, you know, and so reassuring. And um, so just, just remember, you know, that's a function there to stop live stream. And then this is my last slide. I just kind of wanted, it's a screenshot of what it looks like on Facebook. That's the really nice thing. So they're automatically recorded. And now when you go to Practical Farmers of Iowa Facebook page, every single field day is there for you to click on and view um, with the comments um, and it shows our reach. Um, I will say, I think the majority of live views that we've gotten is anywhere between 30 and 40. So the two field days I've hosted, it, um, it toggles, you know, there's, we start with about 34 and at one point there's 39 viewers and, you know, it kind of, you know, toggles while you're live. But so at most we've had about 40 and, but the reach is pretty great. And which just means how many times it shows up in people's feeds. And then the engagement number is um, how many people actually click on it. And then you can get some Facebook analytics of how long they watched it. So um, the other thing on the back end that we're still playing with and trying to look at is how 
like where everyone's tuning in from. So there's a bunch of different analytics on the back end that we're pretty excited about that we can look at through Facebook, which our communication staff is doing. Um, so I am going to stop sharing my screen, but I am going to put a link in the chat box on um, it's to a Google Drive for PFI that has a ton of resources for external partners on virtual field days, tips and tricks, and that same presentation. Um, that was a really bare bones presentation without any like how-to details, but there's PowerPoint slides in there that have chock full of how-to. Um, and our communication staff knows way more about this than even I do. So you, I can always connect you with them. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, answer some questions from you guys. Yeah, thanks, Megan. That was great. You all have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting on figuring this out for the rest of us. So thank you. Absolutely. And like I said, it has been quite the learning curve, like all the little things that we wouldn't know without actually doing it. But now that we've gone through a few of them, it's just going to get easier. And we're going to continue doing virtual events into the future, you know, hybrid of virtual and in-person events. And so there's the link to all the materials. I have a question, Megan, about yeah. the, the kits that you send out. Um, is that like, a, I'm curious about just like kind of like rough cost of like a per kit. And then also, how does that work? Do they kind of send it out to them? They use it and then send it back? Or is the intention to kind of have these out there kind of more and more with farms that are more likely to do future events? Pete, I don't exactly, I don't know how much those things cost, um, the tripod and the earpiece. Um, I'm guessing together it, they probably cost about 75 bucks, but what we're doing is asking farmers to send them back so we can send them out to future field, field day hosts later this summer. Um, I, so some of the very first field days we ordered them from the, and, and put their, address as a shipping address. So they didn't come to the PFI office first because we needed to get it there. Now everything's coming in through the PFI office and we're packaging it all in one box and sending it back out with a prepaid um, return address, return label. Um, the farms that uh, we didn't originally send the prepaid label for, we just sent them a PDF over email so they can send it back. So they don't have to pay for that. We originally had thought that we were so tight for time that we were going to have to have farmer host number one send it to another farmer and not through the PFI office, but we haven't had to do that quite yet. I also think that in the future, we'll probably start writing these equipment costs in into grants uh, as part of our field day costs and then let farmers keep the at least the earpiece because it's just, it's just so helpful. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how much they cost, but I can find out, Pete. Yeah, no, it seems like it, it's not a ton of money and it seems like kind of a nice kit to be able to, to get out exactly. to the folks. And once they get comfortable using it, then again, that learning curve comes down, which, exactly. is, um, which is great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Megan. Uh, yeah. I got a couple questions. And first of all, thanks to you guys for uh, I feel like you guys have gone above and beyond of like writing this stuff up and sharing it with other organizations. So that's been super helpful and I've passed it on to several different people. Great. Um, I guess one of the things that makes me most nervous about virtual events is how reliable the internet is or unreliable. So what's kind of your, how do you go about testing it beforehand and kind of what's your cutoff or I don't know, how do you make the decision of like, okay, this is good enough or maybe this isn't good enough. Um, so what I have asked farmers, well, first of all, because this is new to all of staff and farmers, we tried to ask farmers that we knew that were like somewhat at least tech savvy. Maybe it's farmers that we know already post a bunch on Instagram and, you know, you know, so we tried to like at least go with those, um, with the exception of 
you know, the Mennonite farmer I mentioned earlier, and that's why we did a shared learning call. <laughs> um, but what we've done is ask them, where do you get the best cell reception in your field? So let's film from there. And if, if the, what you want to show off isn't in that area of the field, that's where the pre-recorded video comes in. So they can go to the field, they can film their cows moving to another pasture in a place that's a dead zone where they don't get any cell phone reception. And then they have to go home to their Wi-Fi and download it, you know, upload it through Dropbox. So we're just trying to get around it that way. And then, like I had said with, with PFI staff, there are a few of us that have like not so great internet. Um, and what we did, we made a list. We did a speed test. Everyone, all PFI staff did a speed test. We made an Excel document and we entered everyone's speed test. So we like can now know who can't do it and who can do it. And we, I can't remember, but the communications team did um, find out the bare minimum of, of like upload speeds that's needed. Maybe it's two or something and some of us didn't even have that. So anyway, the other thing is if we're really struggling with internet from our home for whatever reason, we can go to the office in Ames. Even though we're not working from the office, we can, you know, pre, you know, pre-schedule that, make sure no one else is in the office and film for, and go live from the office. So that's another option for us. But with farmers in the hills, pre-recorded video is a good thing to do. And then maybe they could be just sitting at home at their dining room table with Wi-Fi showing the pre-recorded video, and then you cut to them doing live Q&A. That's one way around it. That sounds great. And that ties right into my second question, which is for the Savannah Institute, at least we're trying to do most of our events in that format where it's a farmer indoors with hopefully more reliable internet and then pre-recorded video. Um, and I guess I'm curious, uh, what are, what are some of the things we're missing with that format? What are some of the biggest benefits of having people live in the field as opposed to live from their house with pre-recorded video? You know, Jacob, I, I, some of the pre-recorded video that we've shown was filmed at 6 30 in the morning before the field day at 10 AM, you know, so it's, it's like, well, I don't like to cut it that close, but that happened. And I don't, I think you could have just a high of quality or even higher quality um, field day with the pre recorded video with the farmer at, in their house because the pre recorded video has been coming through like pretty crystal clear. Whereas that's not a guarantee when they're standing in the field. Um, so, yes, real time is good, but if they can be there for a Q&A and to interject, even better. I would say that if you want narration to take place while they're filming that video, they need that mic or something, right, to, to aid in that. Or if they don't have that and all you're hearing is just a bunch of like, you know, wind and cows and you don't need to hear that, just mute it, play it, and have them talk live over it. And that's, I think, just as good as standing out in the field. Great, thank you. Yep. yep. I just want to thank, say thanks, Megan, for sharing all all that and putting that together. Yeah. Um, that's definitely, definitely stuff we will use here in Indiana. We've played a little bit. Of, we had um, some virtual trainings and you know some uh, some similar pros and cons and and challenges and successes as well. So, um, yep, and definitely some additional things we'll bring back here and use. Great. I am curious to ask Jacob, I haven't tuned into a Savannah Institute field day yet. Um, we haven't really done any okay. yet. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. So I'm curious what your plan is and what platforms and et cetera. Yeah, um, as I was mentioning at the very start, uh, we have a new events coordinator now, so I'm not actually gonna be the, the main person hosting those, but um, we just got a Zoom account, so we're gonna be trying to do those, um, as I said, through Zoom with farmers in their house and some pre-recorded video. 
And then we're also looking at uh, separately trying to do some Facebook live streams or we have already done an Instagram live. I think okay. it's just Instagram live, um, but that was pretty short. So um, it sounds like you're doing the two of them together, which is really cool. And um, we're kind of looking at doing those separately. So um, we, we haven't done any Instagram stories, but that would be a good thing. Yep. Yeah, we tried it out. It um, it seemed to go okay. I don't think a ton of people tuned in, but um, you know, it, it was it was pretty low tech. So <laughs> for and, the time we put into it, I think it was fine. And Jacob, those aren't saved though, right? Like only for twenty four hours or something. Um, that's a good question. It wasn't like a. It wasn't an Instagram story. It was an Instagram. Okay live so it was about okay. 20 minutes long i don't i don't know instagram well enough to know whether it got saved or what happened to it afterwards okay um i think you can yeah. save instagram lives and then you okay. can like have a saved story on your instagram page and people can react oh it. okay yeah i think you can save it as igtv now you can have longer clips oh yeah yeah all right Cool. Any last questions for Megan? Great. Well, thank you so much, Megan, again. And I will um, share the recording and then also this resource link, if that's OK, um, with of course. folks who weren't able to make it, because I think we're all like struggling on this front and trying to figure it out. <laughs> Um, so we've got just about 10 minutes left, um, and I just wanted to do a quick share screen um, so that you all can kind of see where um, office hours like this one live on the site. Um, so this is the, the landing page for Regain, um, and office hours are what we're calling an opportunity. So you can navigate to it from this opportunities menu, as um, you may have done to join this office hours, um, and you can see here a list of all upcoming office hours. Um, and so we, again, this is a point of partner engagement. And so we created this um, partnership interest form. Um, oh, no, sorry. This, so if you're interested in submitting a, an office hour session, you can visit the partner guidance page where, where we've sort of aggregated all of the um, features that are unique to the partner role on Regain. Um, and so you can access the submit office hours form that essentially um, will show, like, is a place for you to put in all of the relevant information. So the time, description, who the speaker will be, um, and then the, the admins on our end will go in and create that office hour session and set it up so that um, the Regain community can access it through the office hours page. Um, and the, the plugin that we're using is just a simple Zoom integration. Um, so one uh, limitation of that is that we can only host one session at a time. And so if you look at the events calendar, um, we've created a specific office hours category. So when you're trying to schedule an office hours, you can go to the events calendar, filter by office hours, um, and see um, just upcoming office hours. So you can find a slot that's open, and you can see that um, this session today is on the calendar. Um, and so there are a couple of upcoming features, too, with this. Um, this functionality. One is that there's registration coming so that you can get a better sense of who's interested in your office hours and um, see people have actually registered. Um, and then the other piece that's um, coming up is um, the ability to schedule recurring meetings and recurring office hours. So um, I'm, I guess we're interested in hearing from you all how this was today, um, if, you, if you see potential for this um, fitting in with, with what you all are doing um, and, and what, you know, if there are improvements or other aspects of this feature that, that would be helpful as you think about integrating Regain into the work that you're doing. So this is my first office hours. I missed that the last week's. Um, and so I like the train the trainer type feel, I think, and informal, you know, I, I think that's helpful. And I would, I would love to tune in and learn from others. 
Um, what is the structure if it isn't like this? I, I think it, we imagine it would generally be like this. So okay. there would be an organization or individual presenting on something and then there would be time for just kind of informal um, Q and A and discussion. But I think really it's up to you, like the infrastructure is just a Zoom meeting. And so whoever is hosting can really make it what, what they want. Mm -hmm. And just to add a little bit more onto that, Megan, I think, you know, the idea would be that this would be an opportunity for kind of peer to peer sharing, like you were all figuring out something together and that opportunity to just or even just update each other on what's happening within our organizations. Like that's a, something that we've heard is like, it'd be great if we could just like take 20, 30 minutes and hear what's happening with Savannah Institute. Like, what are you up to? How can we all like, you know, and just cross pollination as well as best practice sharing. We also see that this uh, office hours could be a great way for some of those expert voices to kind of maybe troubleshoot certain topics of interest. Um, and that could tie into some of the online course, the online course function to regain, which we're gonna talk about next week and like building courses, which is something a partner could do. So people could be walking through a self-guided course and then you could be setting up office hours with whoever is the instructor where people could say, you know, I just didn't really get that concept or I have a question about a particular application. So that's an opportunity for um, kind of like an ask me anything or an office hour. And we're seeing that that's a benefit, uh, especially because of just the, uh, how broad of an audience you could potentially reach with some of these experts that, you know, physically are hard to get to, inexpensive to get to different places. It costs mm -hmm. a lot of money to bring them in, but they could tune in for an hour and just popcorn, ask questions, have a discussion around a relevant topic. Um, but I think the whole idea, as Jane said, is just like, keep it informal, keep it conversational, do some presentations, but try not to make it too much like a webinar because we've got those kind of handled in a separate area. On that note, uh, Jacob, I think that this could be a nice way to meet a bunch of new Savannah Institute staff, since I'm assuming there, there are a ton of new staff or... They just keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this could be a great way to do that. Um, I, I was also thinking, uh, I know Jean Schriefer has been working with Grassworks to organize some I forget what they've been calling it, but it, it sounds very similar to this. He just kind of hosts a Zoom meeting. I think they do it every two weeks and people can just tune in and ask questions and they talk about stuff. And I think it's kind of his effort to replace some of the, the conversational aspects of pasture walks to really just, you know, there's not really any topic as far as I know of and people just show up and kind of ask him questions and have a discussion. So, um, I think that's maybe another interesting virtual event to think about and sounds pretty similar to the to the goal of these office hours. Yeah, that's great. And I think and I think the this idea around using these to get to know each other better and and learn more about um, about what other partners are doing is is a great one as well and something I think we're we're interested in um, in sort of kicking off as Wall Center Pastor Project. Another thing yeah, that I just name, sorry, really quickly, you know, we found in the other part of the Wallace Center, their food systems leadership network, they've also used these kind of calls, not necessarily through the exact same platform, but through the food systems leadership network to also do kind of rapid response conversations. They, it was really successful with COVID where, you know, they were getting tons of people on there that basically were just trying to figure out what's happening, where do we, how are we working together? And a lot came out of that. And so I think that that's the other thing is this ability to kind of create a really quick, rapid um, opportunity for folks to just get in the same space, talk through what needs to be talked through um, and, and maybe do some work together in a quick sense. So I think that that was other, also part of this is like speeding up the rate of our interaction and kind of like getting it all in one room rather than, you know, what I do or everyone does is like you call on everyone or emailing everyone. Um, right. this might be a more efficient way to do it. Yeah, that sounds like a, a great way to be using this. And then also it sounds like we're kind of talking about not office hours so much, but a kind of a happy hour room as well, where it could be, you know, no, no specific goal necessarily, but just trying to get to know people and to, to see some new faces. So uh, I think that could be really useful as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the outcomes of all of the 
like moving everything online is that people are getting more comfortable just kind of hanging out virtually and mm-hmm. getting yeah. to each other. Yeah. What do you see as the max number of people you'd want on one of these calls as, as you gain more interest and more people become interested? Do you, do you consider a max? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And, you know, we've got a hard limit through Zoom of 300, but I think you start to lose some of the informality and conversational nature of these sessions if it would get to that point. Um, so I, I think that's definitely something worth thinking about. And, and I think with the registration component to these that's coming, um, we might be able to, to make it more limited because it currently stands anyone on the platform can just see the office hours and join. Um, which we could start to run into problems if, if that were to get too big. But I, I think that's a great point and something that, that we need to think about. So I know we're getting right up to the end of our time here. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for joining today. I think this has been super helpful. Thanks to Megan for sharing. Um, and we do have another uh, demo session next week on courses and we, um, the Wall Center Regain team is actually building a course um, for us all to walk through and talk about how, um, how to build courses, what it might look like for a partner to build a course on the site. Um, so, so be sure to check back into that. We'll be recording that session too if you're not able to join and the course will be live on the site so you can explore, um, explore that at your leisure. So thank you all and uh, have a great Wednesday. And just yep. a reminder, if you come across questions with the materials that I shared, please shoot me an email. We will get it answered for you. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Thanks, all.